Amen. 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 Good morning. Amen. Rise and shine and give God the glory. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you today. It's nice and chilly outside, is it not? How many of y'all love cold weather? Raise your hand. How many of y'all lying? <laughs> what I thought. I love cold weather for a day or two. Maybe a few days scattered here and there. Cold, Christmas. Christmas Eve, let it be cold. Right? Keep that snow stuff. That's for you crazy people. I had an epiphany about this new sermon series. I, I, think I wrote it down on a little uh, sticky note here. That's right before the service started over there. Uh, and uh, it, I have to send some, uh, some credits to Jeff Foxworthy. Either, you know your redneck win jokes, you know? Uh, it says, you know your backslidden win? That'd make a great sermon series, wouldn't it not? You know your backslidden win. You check the weather outside to see if you're going to church or not. <laughs> Isn't that pretty good? Now, don't get too haughty because you're here. The next one is, you know your backslidden win. You think you're more spiritual than everybody else. <laughs> so let's, let's be cautious with all that. Amen. We're getting into our message uh, series. We continue with the, the last of the last days series. This is part five. And... Uh, it has to do with the Jewish dilemma. What about Israel and how, where is Israel and what is Israel in all the context of the days that we call the last days? And I want to talk to you about that today from my heart and from the scripture as well. I want to uh, just uh, kind, of, kind of a whirlwind uh, overview of Israel in the last days and what does the Bible have to say to us and why is it such an important thing for us as Christians to be watching when it talks about the signs of the times. I uh, preached a lot of sermons about Israel, so uh, everything from the, the end time battles in and around Israel to the battle of Gog and Magog, and not going to get into all that today, but I do want to give you kind of a, an overview of the Jewish dilemma and, and what about Israel in the days that we're living in. Uh, I'm looking for the, there it is over here. Anybody test this out to make sure it's working? Apparently not. So, <laughs> don't touch it. <laughs> Just leave it alone. I'm not going to use it. All right? Had the same problem the other campus. It's just I think there was a, a demon inside this sermon. So we're just going to preach it in spite of him. But in Zechariah, open your Bible. Now, this is a good test for you anyway to find out where Zechariah is. Some of you are wondering, is that a book in the Bible? Uh, <laughs> Zechariah, let me give you a little hint. Okay, it's right before the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. All right? So go to Zechariah. Get your Bible out. It's on page 806. Now, I don't know what page, what Bible you have, so don't do that. <laughs> But you, you, better, you should read this book if you have not read it because you are going, uh, hopefully, you're going to be in heaven one day and you're going to run into Zechariah. I, I, you can count on it. You can be sure of it. I mean, even if you're trying to avoid him because you hadn't read his book. What are you going to say to him? I just want you to be ready for when you do meet Zechariah. You can say, man, what a work of art. Certainly, Holy Spirit, great work, Zechariah. I'm glad you took the time. So, uh, so it's not to be embarrassed and have to, because you can't lie in heaven, all right? I'm going to be lying there. So you, you, you better get it read so you don't have to embarrass yourself in front of Zechariah. But Zechariah is a, is a prophetic book. Uh, I've never understood why we call them major prophets, minor prophets. Seems to me anything from the Word of God is pretty major, all right? So he has a word from God, and he's talking about Israel in the last days. Now, and remember when most of these things are written concerning Israel, they're always in, under siege or being destroyed. Or, you know, Jerusalem's been built and rebuilt more than any city in history, all right? And it's, uh, it's, it's always, you know, going through something. And at these times, especially as you move forward 600 more years under the Romans, it's under siege. They're, they're not a nation, all right? So Zechariah is speaking from God, for God, to the people. In verse, chapter 12, get over that chapter, and we're going to look at just about four or five verses in there, starting in verse 2 and 3, all right? I love to hear those little pages turning, all right? Some of you are so used to scriptures being up on the screen for you, you could to, you know, I'm sure you open your Bible every day, but just in case to learn where these pages are. Zechariah 12, 2, verse 3, 2 and 3. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling or trembling to all peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. And all who lift it will be severely injured. And all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. That's a pretty strong word. Move on down to verses 8 and 10. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. 
And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And yes, that is right. It says it right there. 600 years before the crucifixion, they will look at him and whom they have pierced prophetic word about the coming of the Lord Jesus as well as the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ you have wrapped up in these you know we, we've talked about kind of an overview of the end times and haven't spent a lot of time talking about the nation of Israel and the world scene in regard to the nation of Israel this book as I said was written 600 years before Christ came the first time and uh, in this book Zechariah, also Ezekiel and Jeremiah all speak about the return and the restoration in the last days of the nation of Israel. Not only would it be a power within the powers that be, a nation among the nations, but also it would be repopulated that Jews from all over the world would return to the nation of Israel. If you're familiar at all with what's happened in Israel since the 19, late 40s and the early 50s, it has been a nation that's been repopulated from without. They have, millions upon millions of Jews have returned to the land to, to, and, and being brought back to this place in accordance to what the Bible said would happen. The Bible says that God would call them from the north and the east and the west and the south and bring them in. The nation has come back into this place. Now, the interesting thing about the nation of Israel and prophecy, when, these, when, when, when Jesus talked about the nation of Israel and the restoration of Israel, it wasn't a nation. It hadn't been for hundreds of years. They were, they'd been trampled under. They had been dominated by other world forces and other world powers. And the time of Jesus writing, the Romans. Israel was not Israel. It was Rome. All right, It stood with the nations of Rome. Is one of the colonies of Rome. And so they had, they had no national identity anymore. But this is the unique part about Scripture. How could a nation that's so dispersed, has nothing left of it, has been completely dominated, come out of the ashes as it did, and return to a place in the world so much so, <laughs> like Zechariah said, Jerusalem will be a cup of trembling for the whole world. That the whole world will wonder, what are we going to do about Jerusalem? How do we handle Jerusalem? What do we say? You know, it, and that's exactly where it is. There's not one debate on world peace that goes along uh, and happens anywhere in the world without the mention of the Middle East and without Jerusalem specifically, uniquely. Pick up any paper, any, go to any news source at any time. The headlines always have to do with something that's taking place in Israel. What does Israel think? What does Israel feel? Now, under a couple of presidents ago, we began to certainly lighten our, uh, our influence and our standing with Israel as a nation. And over the last two presidencies, under George Bush as well as, as Obama, there's been, a, and even more so under Obama, there's been this lessening of relationships and ties with the nation of Israel. Now, there is that passage in Scripture that talks about that, where, whom the, what nation will bless Israel will be blessed, and the nations that curse Israel are going to be cursed as well. The Bible talks about a time of great intensity for this nation. That once it was restored and once it's repopulated and God brings all these Jews from all over the world, you know, that, that it's going to be a nation in turmoil. It's going to be a nation in distress. And certainly they are. Israel only represents, you know, you talk about something that's a cup of trembling for the whole world. It only represents about 1% of the whole world's population. The, the land mass of Israel on any map you would look today is about the size per square foot or per acre Dimension-wise is Rhode Island. I'll put it even more significantly in a way it will make you think a little better. Let's use Harris County. Harris County is equal in size to the nation of Israel. That'll kind of blow your mind, kind of give you an idea about Texas. Praise God for Texas. But we're living, you know, in a time when the Bible says this little bitty speck on the map will be a source of trouble for the whole world. Now remember, after Jesus had prophesied over Jerusalem, talked about the des destruction of the temple, all that would happen there, the desolation that was come, you know, uh, kind of people just re kind of rejected that. Uh, many people did. But it was in 70 A.D. that under General Titus uh, that the Romans came in and ransacked and destroyed Jerusalem, killed tens of thousands of Jews, if not hundreds of thousands. They scattered the Jews across the world. They were, they were scattered. They were hated. They were dispersed around the world. But remember, Jesus had a lot to say about Israel. He had a lot to say about Jerusalem. 
In fact, in Mark chapter 11, you remember the story where the disciples are coming up and Jesus wants to get some fruit off the fig tree that they see. They come up to the fig tree. It's in full bloom, but there's no fruit. And so Jesus curses the fig tree. He mentioned again in Matthew, they're going up to Jerusalem. And they notice that the next day that they've come by that tree and now it's withered. There's nothing going on with it. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel has been referred to as God's garden, God's wife. It's also referred to in a few places as the fig tree. Jesus is making a prophetic comment when he refers to the fig tree. He comes up to the fig tree. He's not mad because it didn't have a fig on it. I believe that he pretty much knew what was going on to start with. It's a lesson. He wants to make a point here. Now, if you've ever had a fig tree, any fig tree owners, I've had fig trees. I never get figs off of them. The squirrels seem to enjoy them before I get to them. Lynn. No, that's true. <laughs> For those who are members, you may know what that reference is to. But I won't go there. But anyway, you know, when, the, when, the tree, when a fig tree begins to bloom, you know what else begins to happen on the fig tree? At the very same time, not like other trees which put off their leaves, then a blossom, and then a fruit. A fig tree, as soon as the leaves begin to bloom, the fruit begins to come on the tree. Leaf starts, fig start. Same time, they're growing together. So here's a tree that should have fruit but doesn't. Certainly representing the nation of Israel, Jesus has come to the nation of Israel as the Christ, as the Messiah, and they don't show up. They didn't show up in Bethlehem and they had prophetic instruction and clarity about what was going on. Uh, you know, just the, if, as Paul said, there was blindness in part, but that's nothing, that didn't surprise Jesus, all right, because the prophets had said it would be like that, all right? In fact, when the prophets talk about Messiah coming, it, there's this twofold which caused some people uh, confusion as they study prophecy in those days because it seemed that there's these, these two messiahs. There's only one. One is seen as a suffering messiah. The other is seen as a reigning, ruling messiah. It's the same messiah, just two advents, two comings. First coming is meek and lowly Jesus, born in the stable, born of a virgin, comes, offers his life like that purified, holy, pure lamb puts himself on the altar of sacrifice, goes to the cross, dies as the innocent lamb for us. He who knew no sin becomes our sin at Calvary, laid in the earth and raised from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father. The angels even now begin to talk about, at this point, to the disciples who are watching his ascension, saying, hey, this same Jesus will come again in like manner. As he's been received up into glory, he's going to come down in glory. So there's not two messiahs, it's just two aspects, two, two parts of, of this coming. The second time he comes down, we've been talking about in our prophetic lessons. He's coming back as the conquering king, the Lord of glory. Now, as Israel at this point is not ready to receive him, there's blindness in part, like the scripture says. Why, what, what was all that about? Well, when you're that sovereign God, when you see him. But part of what that is all about, and the greater part of what that is all about, is so that Jesus could be offered as our savior to the Gentile world as well as to the Jewish world. That we would have this blessing. And even now, theologians call this time that we live in. And scripture makes reference to this title, the time of the Gentiles. Yeah, many Jews would be saved. The first century church was majority Jewish. The first evangelists were, were Jews. The first disciples are Jews. The first preachers of the word of God are Jews taking the message to not only the Jewish nation, which for the most part rejected Messiah at this point, but opened the door for us to be grafted into the vine that you and I could be saved. Where there was enmity and a wall between God's people and God and, and the Gentile world, God has torn down the, the veil, God's torn down the wall, and we're, we've been invited to be a part of the vine, the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that this blindness in part the scripture talks about was for our advantage. But understand, God is not through with the nation of Israel. We're just getting started, all right? In Genesis, there's a covenant, there's a promise that God makes with Abraham and the nation of Israel. And by the way, let me say this. Israel, Abraham, is the only nation that God has ever made a covenant with at any time. We can talk about in God we trust in America and how we love God and go back in history and see that our country, the founding fathers, for the most part, were strong believers and men of faith and men of, of integrity and strong Christian men. But you do not see anywhere in the context of the establishment of the United States of America where God came down and visited with the founding fathers and said, I want to make a promise to you. 
The only promise we have is this. You bless Israel, you'll be blessed. You curse Israel, you'll be cursed. That's the way it lays down in Scripture. That's why it is important that we do not break our alliances, our support, or our ties with the nation of Israel. There's a curse associated with it. And God says, we read from Zechariah, that in the end times, God's going to deal with every nation that stands against Israel in those days. But let me read you something. We're in Genesis 12, and God speaks to Abraham in verses 1 through 3. He says, And the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great. And so shall you be a blessing. Pause. Hold the moment right there. That was the, na- the reason that Israel became a nation, even though they didn't embrace it, was to, to be the light to the whole world. All right? Continue. And I will bless those who bless you. You shall be a blessing. And those who bless you and the one who curse you, I will curse. And you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. And by the way, through Israel, all the families of the earth can be blessed. Because from Israel comes the commandments. From Israel comes the word. From the nation of Israel, from Abraham's one, from the nation of Israel comes the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the blessing to the nations. He is the blessing to the rest of the world. So we praise God for his promises to the nation and being, ful- being faithful to fulfill those promises. But in the Old Testament, all these prophets were telling the nation of Israel, doom, despair, destruction. Bad days are coming, get ready for them. And they have for centuries experienced in doom and death and destruction and nothing but difficulty and strife and trouble. Ezekiel and his prophecy, remember he talked about the prophecy of the dry bones around Ezekiel chapter 37. And he says, I looked into the valley below and there were just dry bones scattered everywhere. He said, and then the spirit of God began to move and they put on flesh. You know, you don't remember that? Maybe you remember the song, them bone, them bone, them dry bones. Hip bone connected to the leg bone. Leg bone connected to the knee bone. No? Okay. Anyway, when you get old like me, you'll know what that means. <laughs> and some of us do, all right? Anyway, God breathes his spirit. Upon, and this was a prophetic word that God's giving to Ezekiel about the restoration of the nation of Israel scattered all over the world like like a dry bones being scattered, that God will move and breathe in such a way as to bring these people from the four corners of the earth back to the country, and there he will begin to restore the nation. We've seen the first steps of this. In the, in the late 40s, we began to see the first steps of this when they were allowed a little spot of land in the Middle East to return to and begin to establish a homeland. Why is all this happening? Because Israel must be intact to receive her king when he comes. And it's what we've been saying week in and week out. He's coming. And we're living in a day when God is moving in the Middle East in such a way as to, to, we have been able to see the restoration of the nation of Israel against all odds. Many of you have heard me preach in times past about the battles and the wars and the 67, the wars of the 70s and all the times that Israel should have been completely annihilated but wasn't. We, we went over in those messages and shared about the miraculous moves of the Spirit of God and how God moved in different ways in each one of those wars. Even some of the people who have been to Israel with us have had bus drivers tell them about experiences. We, we, we read from, from, from one writer that was there uh, in Israel at the time, I believe it was the, the, in 73 war, when, when uh, the, the Arab world, sur- which surrounds them on every side and outnumbers them thousands to one, had surrounded the nation of Israel and decided that they were going to, to completely decimate the nation invade the land and drive them into the sea. Everything was in place. It was Yom Kippur, the high holy day of the year. Uh, Hardly anybody in their stations in the military fronts of the nation of Israel. The last day anybody would expect a a raid, the high holy day of the year. Nobody's going to invade us, but an invasion took place on that day. And how those nations rolled in within miles of of, of Israel and parked up on the Golan Heights. And one of the, uh, I believe it was the Syrian commanders who'd come in with thousands of tanks. I mean, they had more tanks and and, and, and just on that one front than they had the Battle of the Bulge, all right? He comes in and I I believe, I can't remember the author's name. Who's the guy that writes all this stuff on the the history? There was a minister. Uh, I stole your book from you, Mom, that you had of him. Anyway, she'll think of it in a minute. (laughs) Thank you. 
Lance Lambert wrote in this book, he says, you know, that many were testifying that when they looked up at the goal on that day, there was nothing stopping those Syrian troops from coming in and taking the whole, you know, uh, of the Sea of Galilee region and marching right into Jerusalem. Nothing in their way, nothing stopping them. But they stopped. One of the commanders, Syrian commanders, says, well, we didn't go forward, even though we got kind of orders to go forward. He said, I was just mesmerized. He said, we just stopped, and we just got out of our tanks and all sat on top of our tanks, and we're looking at the, the Sea of Galilee below and just how beautiful it was. And, you know. But those who were down below, according to Lance Lambert, said he talked to some tank commanders who were trying to get their troops back in place from the, from the holidays to get everybody back stationed. He said, it looked like when we looked up on the Golan and saw those tanks parked, there, it looked like a giant hand made out of clouds just holding everything back. For those who were there, I guess it was in 2000 we went there, our, 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 our bus driver says, I was a tank commander, one of the tank group commanders in the Is, in Israeli army at that time, and I can testify that's exactly what took place. It's just a supernatural intervention by God. And Israel has seen these supernatural interventions by God because she, she must be in place when Jesus comes for all these prophecies to be fulfilled. So God is doing these things. And God said in the last days when they are reestablished, and we saw that happen in 1948 as the first step, when all that took place, you've seen it in a nation in turmoil where nation against nation continues to rise against him. Now the Bible says that Israel is going to turn their hearts to God. And God's going to do a miracle. We read about this miraculous movie just a while ago in Zechariah. In fact, when you look at all the pressures and all, you look at all the prophecies concerning all the wars and crises that are going to come up in that part of the world against the nation of Israel, ultimately against God, you understand why David the psalmist said in Psalms 22, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why should we pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Because if we are allies, what troubles Jerusalem troubles us. And what troubles Jerusalem, according to Zechariah, troubles the whole world. What troubles the, the Jews today are the Arabs who hold about two-thirds of the world oil reserves who are surrounding them on every, si on every side. And one of the key influences will not be necessarily the oil that the Arabs hold, will be, I believe, more than, than the oil. As you've seen things change in the last two decades, it's going to be the Muslim influence more than it's the oil influence from the Arab world that creates so much more tension and crisis in the region. Remember, when we looked at our overheads and we put up the, 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 the schedules of kind of God's clock of the last days, we saw the very next event that seems to take place in the order of Scripture is this secret rapture. The two in the field, one's taken, one's left kind of thing, you know, where in that moment where Christ appears like a thief in the night and those who are the, are the, are the saints of God, those who are truly saved, are going to be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. And we realize that if that event takes place, when it takes place, it's going to, be, it's going to create great chaos in the world. Second Thessalonians, and we'll look at that a little bit more next week, but he talks about the restrainer, the, how the, he who restrains, you know, there's, there's a force that God has in place. I believe it's the Holy Spirit uniquely working in the world we live in, uniquely working through the church today. There's this evil restrainer. I mean, it's a Holy Spirit, but he, it restrains the evil that's in the world out there from taking full force. But what happens when the church is caught out and the ministry that the Lord's had through the body of Christ is no longer here? Now, the Holy Spirit's omnipresent. He's going to be, but this particular ministry of restraining is not going to be here. What's going to take place? Well, you know it's going to be chaos. It, I believe right after this rapture takes place, following that is unrestrained evil in the world. And with this unrestrained evil in the world, it's going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog world, every man for itself. Nation rising against nation, you know, people against people, race against race, kingdom against kingdom, like nobody's ever seen before. The forces that held all this in check will be gone. And obviously, if you study scripture, Israel is going to be intensely hated by the nations. The world's going to be in a lawless state. People are only going to care about what they can get. Paul said it will be perilous times. The whole world, more than at any other time in history, is going to be looking for answers. Looking for a man of peace. Someone who can bring some kind of sensibility to the midst of the, of the crisis and the chaos that's going on. For the Jews... It's going to be a great time, particularly for them, uh, I believe, of great introspection. I believe many of them are going to return to the faith of their fathers. Now, Camille, who's lived in Israel for quite some time, she can certainly attest to this fact that Israel's not a religious nation, contrary to a lot of people's opinion. Probably 20% of the nation is religious in the regard to, 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 the, to the orthodoxy of Judaism. But there is a move 
in the church. There is a move among the Jews of many of them already starting to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. If not to Jesus, many of them are going to begin to take a greater interest in the Word of God. And what does the Word of God have to say? Because they're going to see, obviously, so many things that Scripture said would happen will be happening like at no other time. So I believe as this rapture takes place, unrestrained evil breaks loose, then Israel's going to begin to look for some kind of personalized, supernatural, miraculous intervention by God. Where is the God of our forefathers? Now, as this happens, as the world looks for a peacekeeper, that's when you see the Antichrist come onto the scene. And he's charismatic, and he's bold, and he's courageous, he's visionary, he's passionate. He's like, he's like everybody's dream person for the job to bring peace to the world. And uniquely, the peace that's prophesied in the, in the Middle East because of the crisis that's going on there. So enters the Antichrist. We'll talk about him a little bit more next week. But he comes in with this peace plan. It's a pseudo peace plan, and it seems for about a space of three and a half years. There's a promise, most likely, of military aid, economic aid, political, political stability, a right probably to rebuild the temple. Some people say, well, doesn't the dome have to come down? Not necessarily. There's a lot of people who believe that there's plenty of room on top of Temple Mount, and that even where the dome sits is not where the, where the, where the temple originally sat. That there's enough space up there to have that dome of the rock, the Muslim zone, and then a structure could be built. And that's another part of another sermon. We've talked about it in the past. I'm not going to go in there today. But the idea is when Ezekiel, some people take Ezekiel as an illustration because he's talking in, in, in the middle of Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel. He's up measuring. He's on the walls. Of the, the Spirit's taking him up and he's measuring the temple that's in place. And he said, so many furlongs, cubits this way and so many cubits that way and it's this long. He said, and then I looked over from the wall and I saw the profane place. Some people believe that that's a prophetic picture of how that there's probably a profane place, the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim Dome, as well as the, the Holy Temple of God. And so there's, there is a place here where the necessarily, I believe, that the, that dome does not have to come down. Now, let me put it this way. When Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, all right, and he comes in glory, it's coming down. In fact, everybody's coming down. The kings and the leaders... The dictators, the presidents, the rulers of the world will come up to Jerusalem to, to bow before King Jesus. Somewhere in the middle of all this, here's Israel holding their ground by the grace of God. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, you see the battle of Gog and Magog. I've preached on that in the past. You can order one if you want to get some more information from that from the library. Just pick up a tape order form back there and say, I want to get a, a CD or DVD on the battle of Gog and Magog. But we deal in what's uniquely how that Russia, the great bear of the north that's prophesied over and over again in the scriptures, will come down with an alliance that they've made, most likely with the Muslim nations that used to be part of the USSR, because most of those that split off were radical Muslim countries and have certainly drifted deep into Shiite Islamic lifestyle, with, you know, with, with the Quran being their, their main driving force. So this force comes down, God brings them down, it says, he puts a hook in their jaw, draws them into the Middle East, for this time, there's going to be these nations that gather around Jerusalem and around Israel. The nation of Israel, seeing this alliance take place, obviously is looking for answers, all right? God sovereignly, supernaturally steps in and destroys the enemy that at, that's at the gate. Now, it's not without great loss. It's not without problems. It's not without issues for the nation of Israel itself, which I believe with all the pressure... That's going on. It adds more, uh, I think, opens the door even more for Antichrist to be believed with his little pseudo peace treaty. But three and a half years into the peace treaty that's made, we're not sure where Gog and Magog, that battle takes place, but at the beginning of it, in the center of it somewhere, the Jews began to, so say, make door open for this Antichrist leader. But Daniel mentioned something, Jesus mentioned something that's called the abomination of desolation. A little bit more on that next week. But it's basically when the Antichrist, whoever this man is, walks into the temple and says, I'm God, worship me. I'm God, worship me. Israel finds itself at a place of utter hopelessness and helplessness to ultimately they come to the place where they call on the Lord, whom, that, whom they, they feel at this point is the only place to go. They've been forsaken by the so-called advocates of the peace treaty, They've been forsaken by friends, by world leader. All alliances are gone. Gog and Magog has happened. And Ezekiel 39 says, 
It's somewhere in all this point of desperation, God does this supernatural work. And Ezekiel 39, 22 says, Then the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God. Whether it's the victory at Magog and Magog or whatever it is that's happening in the context of all this, God is so supernaturally revealing himself to Israel, they know who he is again, and they're aware of his presence. Romans 11, verse 25, the Apostle Paul says that blindness has happened in part to the Jews until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When is that time fulfilled? I believe it's fulfilled ultimately when the rapture takes place, when the church is gone. We are in that time, the time of the Gentiles, and a time when the Jews, for the greater part, would reject that blindness would come. I say, I don't understand it. It's a mystery. It's a biblical mystery. There's a blindness. In fact, that kind of word, if you look at it closely in the New Testament, it's a blindness that's due to callousness. A blindness that's been caused by rejection, ultimately, of the revelation of Messiah. Now, it says that they'll be saved. Saved. What does it mean that all Israel, in verse 26 of Romans 11, says, all Israel shall be saved. Now, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen at a certain time. Time, the time of the Gentiles is done. It's going to happen in a time of great distress and despair, but the nation of Israel is going to turn to God. Now, Isaiah mentions only a remnant will be saved. The scriptures talk about 144,000 that will be saved. Is there a contradiction of the nation of Israel versus 144,000 being saved? I believe when the apostle's writing here, and he says all Israel, we say, he's talking about nationally. You know, that God's going to save the nation from annihilation. All right? Then there's this other part about this redemptive aspect of how many are going to be saved, all right? We don't know ultimately, I believe many of them are going to be saved, but we do know that 144,000, according to the word of God, are going to be saved in an instant. Now, I believe it's, they're not just going to be sleeping in bed, oh, I think I'll get saved today. I think that because of despair, because of the pressure, because of now the, new, the, the obvious evidence of God manifesting himself and delivering from this this great bear, this invasion that was taking place because of the, the destruction that they've seen before them and, and God sparing them, that there's going to be a lot of people who see that and, that, and there's going to be a day when 144,000 of them wake up and see Jesus in their heart and mind and life and trust him by faith. Now, some people think it's a contradiction about 144,000 being saved because, well, you know, Brother Joe, you said that the, that the Holy Spirit was gone. I never said that. I said the church is gone. Only two ways to get saved, by the way. One is by the work and the witness of the Holy Spirit, and the other is by the, the witness and the work of the Word of God in our lives, all right? The Spirit and the Word. You've got you to know the Word. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus delivers us from our sin, paid the price for our sins, and that the Holy Spirit brings light and life to that. Well, the Jews will obviously see the witness of the Spirit because in Ezekiel 39, 29, God says, I am not going to hide my face from them any longer, for I will have poured out my Spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord. In other words, God says, I mean, let's go back to Pentecost. God just poured out His Spirit one day, didn't He? Thousands were saved. In a matter of weeks, tens of thousands had been saved. In a matter of moments, 144,000 at least are going to turn to Christ, representing every tribe of the nation of Israel. They're going to come to faith in Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit is going to open their eyes. And then there's the testimony of the word. You say, well, who's going to be preaching to them? Well, the scripture says that God's sending two pretty good preachers. I believe it's Moses and Elijah that appeared with Jesus on the, on the Mount of you know, Transfiguration where their identities were exposed to us. The, the testimony, they, they came and they testified to the deity of Christ Jesus. I believe they're going to come back for the second part of that sermon. They're going to witness, just as they did to those few, they're going to witness to the masses of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's reasonable to say, if Moses and Elijah show up in town, there's going to be a revival. <laughs> Especially among the Jews. Might not mean something to the Goyims, the Gentiles, all right? But it's going to mean something to the Jews. When Moses and Elijah come into town preaching the word of God. Revelation 7 forces and 144,000, 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. John sees this as he's being showed around the, the heaven in the book of Revelation. Sorry if you're a Jehovah Witness. It doesn't include you. Little Amen. It'll sink in later. Do it by faith. <laughs> There's going to be 
144,000 on fire, pumped up, fire-breathing preaching Jews, out there preaching the word of God during the time of the greatest turmoil the world has ever known, preaching the word of God. And now a lot of people are going to lose their life over this. People are going to die for this. But I mean, just look at, um, just look at the parallels from, from uh, Sunday before Christmas, the 22nd. Is that what it is? I think it's the 22nd of that Sunday. I'm going to preach about uh, and give you, uh, we're going to lay out the first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming side by side and look at all the unique parallels. But let me just mention a couple here. You know, who, who's going to be preaching the word of God when, when this happens? Just as it was in the first century, it was Jews. Who's going to be preaching the word of God this time? It's going to be the Jews. First time around, first century church, who's going around the world preaching the word of God? It's the Jews. All right. Second time, who's it going to be? It's going to be the Jews again. Kind of like Jonah. I mean, there's a prophetic message in the book of Jonah. Jesus says that about only about himself and the resurrection. But there's the people who refuse to take the word of God to the world. Now they're encountering God by disaster. And now they're going out and preaching the word of God. Who are they going to preach to? Just Jews? They're going to preach to everybody. They're going to evangelize. In fact, only two kinds of folks in the world you boil down to as far as, you know, the context of things. It's Jews and Gentiles. You're in one of those categories. And there's only two kinds of Gentiles. Those Gentiles that have heard the gospel and those Gentiles that hadn't heard the, jo- the gospel. Those Gentiles who had heard and received and believed the gospel are gone. Now, obviously, we know that during the time of tribulation, there's going to be people who are probably saved outside the influence of these 144,000. They're going to be saved because, you know, they probably sat under my preaching for a long time and realized they missed it. Now, the problem, that's really not correct. They may have said I'm out preaching for a long time, but if that's you, you will not get saved in the tribulation. Because according to what Paul said about the strong delusion, if you heard it, understood it, and didn't believe it, but you chose to live your life and believe a lie than the truth, he says you're going to be damned. I mean, that's King James terminology. There's no hope for it. In other words, people say, I'm going to just wait around the tribulation to get saved. <laughs> I'm sorry, you won't. The Bible says God has sent a strong delusion unto you. In other words, there's going to be this mysterious thing that happens after the rapture, obviously with this, 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 this power of evil that's let loose in the world, that those who heard and understood it, they're not going to be interested in receiving it. What about those who heard and didn't understand it? I think they're going to turn to Christ. They're going to say, didn't somebody tell me about something like this? And they're going to get their Bibles out, and they're going to start seeking answers. But obviously, these people are going to be reached by, the, many, most of it's going to be reached by this, this witness of these Jews, these 144,000, that they go out and preach the word. But if you go to 2 Thessalonians, mark it down to 2, 10 and through 12, you're going to find out in 2 Thessalonians 2, that's where it talks about the strong delusion, and there's not going to be hope. In other words, if you know you need to get saved, Especially due to the fact we realize now with the birth of the nation of Israel, we know that we're in the last days. Jesus said that generation shall not pass away. Hey, for generations anywhere from 50 to 100 years, you ain't got long. Now's the acceptable time to give your life to Jesus Christ. But there's millions all over the world who hadn't understood the gospel. The tribulation is going to take millions of, billions of lives, but millions will be saved during this time and saved in this tribulation period as a result of the ministry of these faithful Jewish folks. It's going to cost them their lives. They're going to be beheaded. In the last three and a half years when Antichrist controls everything, remember, no buying, selling, trading, you don't take the number of the beast, no hope of salvation. But listen to what happens as John is getting his holy land tour in, the, in heaven. After this, he said in Revelation 7, verse 9, I beheld a little great multitude. No man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes. They had palms in their hand. And they're crying with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and they fell before the throne of their faces and they worshiped God saying, Amen and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? He already knew the answer. That's just, you know, that's my mother's method of teaching. She knows the answer when she asks you the question. By the way, if you ever get arrested and they take you back and start asking you questions, they already know the answers. (laughs) Not that you're going to be arrested. Okay, anyway. (laughs) Who are the 
days. I, I don't know. And that's John said, I, sir, you know. And he, then he said, yes, I do. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And he goes on in Revelation 20. He said, and I saw the thrones and, I, and, and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast nor his image and hadn't received their mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ in a thousand years. What a blessing of, when we see the end of times, how that God's, even in the midst of hell on earth and judgment upon the nations, mercy still moving. God still touching lives, moving in the hearts of those who yet to, to be saved. Yeah, again, do you, do you see all the parallels? When Jesus Christ came the first time, Rome said, you cannot say Jesus is Lord. It's going to cost you life. It's going to be the same in the end. You believe every jungle, every village, every nation, it's going to cost you your life. It'll cost you your life if you refuse to say, I believe that the beast, the Antichrist, he's Lord. You, you don't agree with that? You lose your head. So it began, now it ends, and it ends like it began with Jewish evangelists. It ends where it all began, in the Garden of Eden, in the Middle East, where everything starts. All history is now wrapping up, and where's everybody's attention going to? Back to that part of the world. Like the angels on that first Christmas morning who are saying, glory to God in the highest. Hey, we're going to be gathered around the throne of God. Those who've trusted and received him are singing, glory to God in the highest. For those first century Christians who trusted in faith and believed in Jesus, it cost them their life. For these last century Christians, during this time of Antichrist, it's going to be the same thing. I know some people say, well, I would never call Satan or the beast or the Antichrist Lord. But you hadn't called Jesus Lord then you'll call him Lord. When it affects your pocketbook, a lot of people are already calling it Lord. There's too many people today who are looking for answers and too many Christians who are being far too silent. We know where this whole thing's going. I fully believe with every fiber of my being that everything he said would happen is happening. It's happening now. This is no time to be cold. This is no time to be calloused. This is no time to be wrapped up in your own little world, your own little opinions. This is the time to, you know, quit talking about what so-and-so wore on Sunday versus what you had. This is no time to be comparing yourself with people, picking out if it's cold weather or good weather to go to church today, deciding if I want to give or not give, deciding if I want to love or not love or forgive or not forgive. There's no time for that. The Bible says our salvation is near than we first, but it's time to get on board and serve Jesus. It's not time for kind of lagging around the, the shadows on the outskirts of what God's called you to do. It's time to get on fire. It's time to be alive. It's time to be full of Jesus. It's time to be realizing who we are and what we're here for and that we are here for such a time as this. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus said in Isaiah, come, let us reason together. Amen. It's time to use a little reasoning power. It's time for every man in this room to man up. It's time for you to be a man. It's time for you to be a man of God. It's time for you to be a man that leads your home righteously. It's time for you to be a man that, that loves your wife, washes the word, and loves your kids. It's time for you to be the man that leads them to church, leads them to the word. That's the kind of man God's called me. It's time for every woman in this room to quit looking to the world to find your sustenance and your satisfaction. The world has nothing to offer you. Your life is going to be found by totally committing it to Jesus Christ and surrendering to his lordship. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And let me conclude. It's time for every young man and every young girl and every teenage boy and every child in this room to hear what God is saying to you. You've been birthed into a time that is like no other time in history. You've been given an opportunity to witness what prophets of God did not get to see. Get on fire for Jesus. Get excited about Christ. Don't bow down to the world. Don't submit to whatever is acceptable and popular and what everybody else is doing. Fall in love with Jesus. Be what God's called you to be. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, what a blessing.